call this meeting to order of uh, the Comox Valley Regional District uh, Electoral Area Services Committee. Call it to order for uh, uh, Monday, November 4th, uh, 2019. And uh, I see we have lots of people in the gallery, which is great. So a few house housekeeping items before we get started. One is the washrooms, the one, number one most important housekeeping items beside emergency exits. Washrooms are down the hall on the right and through the door and we share them with MOTI, with Ministry of Transport next door. So if you have to step over a couple of potholes, you know what that's about. <laughs> also, um, in case there is kind of an emergency or some kind of a, a, a unforeseen uh, calamity, uh, what we do is we have three exits. One is where you came in through the front door, the other is down here through the hall into the, into the back, and the other is through the committee room over here, which is also an exit out. Mustering point is in the parking lot out front. So that being said, um, I think we're going to get started. Uh, first of all, let me just start by um, acknowledging the fact that we are conducting our business today on traditional unceded territories of our Comox First Nations people. So we're going to plow right into it. Uh, I guess our first uh, item of business is receiving a management report uh, from October 2019 for receipt. Move and second on receipt. And uh, discussion on the management report, uh, Director Hamir. Great, thank you. Um, just a question, I know it's come up a few times around the Freedom Mobile um, request, uh, item number four, and I'm just wondering if it's, um, if it's something that, is, that we actually think is going to be replied to or if we should just take it off the management report. Um, we, we discussed this when reviewing the agenda with the chair and there was nothing to update at this time but no reason to take it off the agenda. But we will look into it and see if we can provide you any, any insight at the next meeting. Thank you. Seeing no further questions um, on receipt, I'll call a question. All in favor, and that carries. Uh, on to reports, advisory planning commission minutes for receipt. Are we receiving all the minutes in? Okay, and uh, speaking to the minutes, Director Hamir. Yeah, um, so just a question to staff. Um, around the conversation around the cannabis um, bylaw changes, um, we had a pretty fulsome discussion in Area B, at the Area B advisory, and I know a few days later that was presented to the Agricultural Advisory Committee. Um, do you know what their res like? I didn't see too much in terms of their response. Did were they were they told some of our uh, recommendations and did they have any comments on um, like soil typing and, and things like that? Good morning, through uh, the chair and to Director Hamir. Um, yes, um, you're correct. Uh, this item was presented to the Ag APC. Uh, there was some discussion, but um, overall, um, uh, their, um, the, the APC supported us moving forward. Okay. Um, there was discussion in regards to s um, soil locations and everything that we discussed yeah. previously, okay. um, but, um, but, but overall, it, it, it was supported. And so no red flags about the comments that were made at Air Area B? Yeah. yeah. Okay. From my understanding, no. Okay. Yes. So seeing no further lights, call a question on receipt of all the advisory planning and commission minutes. All in favor, and that carries. Moving along to item two, Electoral Area C temporary use permit for 627, 4635, 4639, 4745, 4749, 4751, and 4753, Forbidden Plateau Road. Uh, report for receipt. Move and second on receipt. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. Ton True, our Manager of Planning Services, is here, and Brianne LeBute will join him at the table to present the report and answer any of your questions. Through the Chair to the Electoral Area Services Committee, I'd like to start by inviting the applicants, Tanya Woodbeck and Ken Peterson, to come join me at the table. So the application before use for a temporary use permit for three test and tune weekend events per year for a period of three years, which is the maximum um, period a TUP could be issued. 
the applicants sitting beside me here are representatives of the Van Isle Airfield Society and they've made an application on behalf of the owner of the property. The subject property is 17.3 hectares in size and it contains a federally regulated aerodrome with a paved airstrip. Test and tune events have been held on the property in the past without the benefit of a TUP and staff determined this use wasn't permitted and therefore a TUP is required. The purpose of a test and tune event is for members of the association to evaluate and improve the performance of their vehicles prior to <coughs> attending drag racing events around the province. It's not a drag racing event where vehicles compete against each other, but it's probably still worth noting that the timing system can test two cars at the same time. So have been informed there would be situations where two cars would be running at the same time. The proposed events also include barbecues and limited overnight camping. Proposed weekend dates are in May, July, and September with set testing hours on Saturday and Sunday. According to the applicants, these dates were chosen to predate races elsewhere and they were to avoid long weekends and other community events such as snow to surf. The applicants have requested the ability to reschedule for poor weather. If it rains, they can't test the vehicles within two weeks of a cancelled event. Staff recognize that the events create unavoidable noise that do impact the adjacent neighbours and it's difficult, if not impossible, to, to mitigate that type of noise. We also recognize that it's really challenging to find a safe location to, to host this type of event that would have a, a paved airstrip and not be too close to the, the main centers. And looking at the surrounding land uses, certainly there's residential neighborhoods, but the zoning in that whole vicinity is rural 20. And in that zone, depending on the lot size, the zoning does allow other disruptive uses such as logging, dog kennels, agriculture, gravel extraction, and sawmills. So it certainly is an area where we, we see some disruptive uses. Um, as a result of public notification, we did receive 16 letters. Two of those letters were in support, and those were from properties within the vicinity. Then five other letters of support were from outside of the neighborhood. We did receive nine letters of opposition. One of those was from outside of the neighborhood, but still expressed some concerns. The remaining eight letters of opposition represent five households. In several cases, there would be two people from each household that would submit a letter. The main concerns that we received from neighbor letters were about the noise, but also about fire safety, impact on park and park users, um, being a commercial use, growing over time to have greater impact, climate change impacts, um, poor community relations, security, impact on property values, among others. Um, this application was brought forward to the Advisory Planning Commission. They did support the application and at the time they recommended that the applicants attend the Forbidden Plateau Residents Association meeting, which they did. Um, previous events have run without the benefit of a TUP, therefore there's no conditions for the, um, the users to abide by. One benefit of issuance of a TUP is that it allows the CVRD to include and enforce conditions that mitigate some of the disruptive effects on adjacent neighbours. Those would mostly be around frequency and timing of events, hours of vehicle testing and number of vehicles. The applicants had requested to be able to reschedule any of the events for up to two weeks after. Staff recommend that only one of those three events could be rescheduled due to rain to the only the following weekend just to provide a little bit more certainty to the neighbours. And then the other recommendation we have is that the expiry date would be September 20th, 2020. So that represents three events, so one year opposed to the three years. The draft TUP conditions address liability, insurance, safe egress, and fire safety. And as the use is temporary, the, the temporary use permit contains a condition that no land alterations solely for the purpose of test and dude events will be permitted. And while staff recommend the above, because we believe it represents a full trial year to evaluate the true impacts of the events, we did present an alternative option in the report, which would be one day per event for vehicle testing with no ability to reschedule due to weather. Um, then at this time, we don't recommend this approach because we don't believe it represents, as I mentioned, the full one-year trial. An application for renewal in one year's time, should this get approved, would allow staff to evaluate the impact of events within the parameters of the TUP conditions and also evaluate whether those conditions were adhered to. And then at that point, it would be appropriate to potentially recommend further restricting the event or to recommend refusal. Thank you, Mr. Chair.
Thank you very much. Do the directors have any questions of the uh, staff? Director Arbor. Thank you. Um, thanks for the presentation and the report. So a uh, question to staff. I'm trying to get my mind around those temporary use permits. And uh, I mean, coming from Hornby, we usually issue them. I mean, this there's a zoning um, issue here in the, in the sense that the property is not zoned for these types of event. Um, and where I am, what they would do, you know, issue, they can issue a temporary use permit for a year, or sometimes they'll, they'll have a maximum time, amount of times that you can apply for a temporary use permit before you have to apply for rezoning. Is it the case here, or, or is this something that they could co come back year after year for the next 50 years and, and keep reapplying? Mm -hmm. So um, through the chair to Director Arbor, so a temporary use permit, like as it stands, can be renewed once, but then they would be for a maximum of three years, but then they would be able to come forward with a brand new application for a temporary use permit. And, and, and then again, three years after, and a You can renew that same permit, and then. So we know that property, I mean, we are, um, you know, there's a number of events that, that are occurring, but I guess what we're bumping into is really that, that zoning <coughs> question. I'm not sure that what we're talking about for that property is temporary anymore. I, I, if we're going to let it happen from year to year, um, I, I, you know, so basically I disagree with temporary use permit that can be renewed forever. I think at some point you, you have to go through some kind of formal zoning, rezoning, uh, if those events are going to occur. And my question perhaps to you and, and maybe to the proponents would be, um, obviously there's a Sar Saratoga Speedway. Uh, there's other places that, so there was a comment that it may be hard to find a different place, but I'm, I'm, you know, that one jumps to mind. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm just, uh, yeah, I'm just wondering if, if that's been considered at all about the alternatives for the proponents. I'm aware of some of the deficiencies of Saratoga, but I'll probably pass that on to the applicants as they'll be better yeah, informed it's, it's to answer an that question. Track. But yeah. uh, maybe the, the question about TUPs has been answered properly? Because mm -hmm. I don't think we've ever had a never-ending TUP. Yeah, and, and that's Usually that's a consideration. Yeah. yeah, and it's a consideration in my decision because, I mean, we did approve cheaper Paloods a, a few months back, uh, and, and, and one of the deciding factor for me at the time is there wasn't a lot of uh, public pushback on it. And now we're sitting on, on the number of residents that, that have concerns with the activity and that have come forward. So to me, that changes the dynamic, especially around a temporary use permit. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll continue to listen and, and listen to the arguments. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Director Hamir. Um, thank you. And you know, my questions basically mirror what uh, Director Arbor just said. I was wondering about Saratoga. Um, and then my question to staff was around if uh, the other events, if they were aware if Jeepal Palooza was going to apply again. Um, <coughs> from the last time that we uh, allowed the temporary use permit for that event, do you know if those um, uh, applicants were going to apply again? Um, because I recall saying that, um, that, that this would be a one-time okay. Mm -hmm. Um, have they indicated if there's going to be other, um, you know, a, a, a different location for, for 2020? We have not been in contact with those applicants, but certainly I think that message was understood right. from the comments at the meeting. Okay. And I think moving forward with different temporary use permits on this property, one of the things staff will really have to review is can this event be held somewhere else? Right. And so when we were looking at this particular use, one of the struggles was the lack of other places to right. host it, where Jeepa Palooza, for example, could be held at yeah. another. And, and then, I, yeah, I have a couple of questions for the applicant around, like, the need for t test and tune events, like, what, you know, why, why here, and why, um, why at all, um, and because I know the association has events around Vancouver Island, and are there other um, regions that would be more suitable that would have the facilities? So, but I'll let the applicants reply. You're asking uh, the. Well, I'm. I'm going to. You're asking the the applicants themselves. Yeah. yeah. Are you folks okay to speak to that? Sure. Mm -hmm. You want to talk? Yeah. Cool. To the 
to uh, about to Saratoga. Anyway. Oh, you're more, uh, <coughs> a little so, bit more familiar with Saratoga um, and why. We have no other place to be able to do this. Um, Port McNeil, for instance, is racing only, no testing. Victoria, racing only, no testing. Saratoga Speedway, um, it's too dangerous at the end of the track for shutdown for our cars. Um, they have no timing system. Um, so what we do, there is another, no location on Vancouver Island at the moment for this. The reason that we test. That? The reason that we test. Yeah, and, and why we test is, is so that we either go to Port McNeil, Victoria, Vancouver, uh, elsewhere in the province or down in the States. The idea of this is so that we can take our vehicles, test them, and get better at racing so that we have a chance of winning a race. Um, we've got people down in the States that they have racetracks all over the place and they actually put on test and tunes, right? Vancouver puts test and tunes. Um, we can rent the track in Vancouver. It's thousands of dollars for us to travel there. It's thousands of us dollars to rent the track um, to be able to go to these test and tunes. So on Vancouver Island, this is the only place as the moment that we have to be able to do this. And that's why we have people coming from Port McNeil, Victoria, Nanaimo, is because there's no other place to be able to do this. Okay, and uh, Director Arbor. Yeah, thanks for the, the really good explanation. Um, it complicates things for me a little bit, though, because <laughs> obviously there is a culture and there's a lot of people that are kind of looking forward and relying on, on that uh, venue and event. But what that confirms to me is that you, you know, I think of temporary use permit, I think of, hey, you know, our family's going to pitch a 500-person wedding on the big agricultural land this year. That's a temporary use permit. To me, you know, that's more in the spirit of it. And what I'm hearing is your, um, you know, this facility could be used for the next 50 years if the culture continues to be vibrant and there's no alternatives out there, if Satoga doesn't extend their their track, I don't know much, sorry, about the, about drag racing, but if they don't extend it and put timers and all that stuff, what you're saying is this is the place that would continue to be the place on Vancouver Island. And so for me, that kind of screams rezoning uh, so that there's a proper public process and, and feedback from people as to whether it's okay, particularly if, I think it, again, it would be different if, if all the neighbors were celebrating the event and, and all the rest of that, but there's some issues. So for me, I struggle with the potential of having a temporary use permit that will just continue to issue forever, and that won't necessarily address uh, neighborhood concerns or zoning concerns around the property. So uh, it makes it tough. I don't know if uh, fellow directors have more comments, but I'll keep thinking. I understand the importance for you guys, but at the same time, I want to make the right decision. Well, I think what's before us, Director, is a one-year temporary use no, permit. No, and I understand that, but there's also signals that, <laughs> or, or even, you know, to, to, uh, to really, um, I'm just, yeah, I realize that that is the uh, decision. So that would come before you again? Yeah. So for but, but we could, I mean, what I'm trying to say is there's a few options, and I don't know if staff would comment on that, but uh, uh, we could defer the decision to, you know, to consider whether a rezoning process would be more appropriate or, or whether I know staff is recommending one year uh, as a trial or two years as a trial or so one year as a trial. Uh, I'm not sure if, if that would be set, if we're just pushing back decisions we have to make. You know, if we'd, if we'd rather just go through it now, especially when there's public interest in, in this issue right now. So that's kind of the stuff that I'm struggling with in my, in my mind. My understanding is that the, uh, the one-year trial is to gather more information. So. Yeah, okay, so, so, have more information so a follow-up question then, that thank you for leading me on this, um, is, is what, what could we expect in a one-year trial that is not just issuing the permit? So what kind of public engagement, what kind of uh, feedback or analysis would be performed? Because you did not mention that staff would do analysis, but maybe it'd be good to have a bit more detailed for us to understand how we may end up with better information next year and with, with neighbors that may actually support that one-year trial or, or anything like that that you can detail that would be useful. Through the chair, if I could comment just on the TUP versus rezoning as well. So normally when applicants are interested in applying for either, we would sit down and have a pre-consultation meeting with them. When it is a land use that could be a little bit more controversial, it's, it's almost always recommended to go through the temporary use permit. 
Reason being that if you rezone a property and you don't quite get it right, then you don't really have an easy opportunity to change things. So, so certainly I think the applicants were counseled in this case to apply for a temporary use permit for it to actually represent a true trial. In terms of analysis, the permit contains a number of conditions that they wouldn't have had to have abided by in the past. And so really the evaluation of the impact event would be around the adherence to those per, um, permit conditions and whether or not those permit conditions actually do mitigate some of the disruptive effects. Again, I think we're not pretending that the noise can be made yeah, to sure. go away because it can't, but we're hoping by limiting, say, the number of cars to 30 cars, which we chose cars because cars are easier to count than people. <laughs> yeah. So 30 cars and, and limited hours and just having more parameters and more certainty, or maybe our evaluation would include like having the ability to reschedule just inconvenience the neighbors that much more. Maybe that's an aspect we want to look at changing. So, sure. so it's going to be more about adherence to the conditions and do the conditions help mitigate any of the disruption at Sure. All. So I'll just have a quick follow-up and, and a comment for the applicants, which I mean at Jeepapalooza too. You know, in a few years you guys will have, like me and others, will have fully converted to electric cars, therefore there will be no noise issue. So that's one consideration. <laughs> a bunch of Teslas running. <laughs> um, but uh, on a more serious note, um, so yeah, so I understand. it would. Um, I understand the analysis, so that's a bit what, what we did with Jeepapalooza, is we, we set a bunch of conditions and, and we tightened up what happened. Um, is there any opportunity, again, the difference is I think we got quite a few letters this time from, from the immediate neighborhood. Is there an opportunity um, for, the, for the neighbors and, and, and the neighborhood to review that criteria with staff or, or to have kind of any input into what that trial looks like, or is it just staff is gonna go with best practices in uh, in considering that TUP? Through the chair to Director Arbor. So the, the way the process works, the neighbor letters would have gone out giving general information about the proposal, but it wouldn't have included the staff recommendations. So at this point, that's part of the public agenda, the staff report. Yeah. So certainly, I guess if the application was to be deferred, that it would give people more time to comment on the conditions that we have chosen as part of the temporary use permit. Thank you for that. But what we found through the adjacent neighbor letters is that most people that were in opposition commented on reasons for being opposed, opposed to providing recommendations on if the event was to move forward, what could be changed. Sure, and that's that's legitimate. And so for me, yeah, I, I mean, in an ideal world, it, it'd be nice to see if we could build a, a little bit of support for the one-year trial, understanding that that it's it's a trial. And I mean, we'll be sitting here in office for the next three years, so. Um, uh, to me, the broader questions around the TUP will remain. I mean, I'm almost thinking, you know, so I'll park that for now, as, as Mr. Chair said, we're, we're, uh, we're just considering for this year. But um, thank you. I'll, I'll still think about the deferral option if, if staff believes that that would create time to better engage with the neighbors and the proponents so that everybody feels comfortable about the one-year trial. Thank you. And Director Hamir. Great. Thank you. Um, so while reviewing the file um, and reviewing the, the agenda further on to, um, you know, I came across a reference um, in the item regarding the Denman Island bulk water um, sale that under the regional growth strategy implications that um, strategy goal number eight, climate change was was flagged because of the amount of vehicle traffic that would be coming on and off the island in terms of bulk water sales. And it occurred to me that um, we hadn't flagged this application in, in terms of um, its impact on climate change and a number of the letters we got from the public um, were concerned about uh, the CBRD um, supporting uh, an event that really does have an impact on greenhouse gas emissions. We, <coughs> we as a board have declared that we acknowledge the climate emergency and so I don't know if staff had a chance to think about you know this TUP in terms of both that declaration and the RGS mm -hmm. and then number eight climate risk. So through the chair to director Hamir, so certainly we do review the RGS against all planning proposals. And in this case, 
It was more a matter of scale. The proposed test tune vents are represent six days with mm. limited hours of racing per year. So it was more looked at under the lens of a special event opposed to certainly if this was going to be proposed as a racetrack that's going to be running all the time, then I think we would have had to reflect a bit deeper on some of those RGS climate change okay. policies. So what, were you just looking at the, uh, the, the actual cars that were being tuned, yeah. but were you looking at the other folks that would be camping and the amount of traffic that was coming up into that area and just general movement of people that was very car dependent? Mm -hmm. The focus certainly was on the use, but yeah. that being said, it's clear in the permit conditions that this is intended for the association and just people directly <coughs> connected to the right. association. So again, if it was open to the public, I think that would be a lot okay. of traffic coming in. And we've made that clear that that's not what we're intending these events to be. There's liability concerns with opening it up to the public. And the applicants have also made it clear that these events aren't intended to re recruit very, very large crowds of people. Thanks. Thank you very much. And I'm just wondering if the applicants have anything to, uh, to add on their own. Uh, yes, please. Um, and uh, um, I'd like to thank you, uh, thank the chair and the directors for the opportunity uh, to present and answer questions res with regard to this temporary use permit application. Um, I just wanted to introduce us a little bit. I'm not going to take up too much time, but um, as Van Isle Airfield Society, we're a close network of family and friends who have friendships, relationships, um, <coughs> both business and personal, that span decades with the property owners at the subject uh, property on Forbidden Plateau Road. We formed a society in order to cover the expenses of operating which are extensive we currently have 45 paid member drivers so those are drivers with cars um, and that was for the 2019 season and uh, I don't anticipate any change in that number should we get to um, uh, approval for the uh, <coughs> For the trial. Um, on behalf of the club, we'd also like to acknowledge that we know and respect that we are in the backyard of rural residents and the intent of our hours and operation, I hope, demonstrates that we definitely have considered this. Um, myself and my family too live in a rural area and uh, fire is always a concern. Um, there's always uh, things that you think about that you wouldn't normally think about when you live in town. Um, and typically at an event uh, where there is actual racing, like some of the ones that Ken described earlier, um, they run from 9 in the morning to 5 o'clock or later at night with little to no breaks. Um, uh, if approved, the temporary use permit uh, will allow us to have parameters to work within that are governed by the CVRD uh, to control our numbers um, for ourselves and the residents um, so that we're not left to our own devices. Um, um, and uh, oh, I'd just like to simply go over uh, quickly what a typical weekend looks like uh, for us as per the past events. So Friday evening, um, volunteers and members from out of town who are camping arrive to set up. Typically, there's two to four uh, people from Victoria that come and camp up there, as well as myself and my husband and my teenage son with his friends we camp there as well so that we can receive people make sure everything's you know in order uh, Ken stays there on the weekend as well um, we set up the garbage cans receive the porta potties um, and really just set up um, and we're all typically settled in by about seven in the evening on the Friday uh, Saturday morning um, we begin at uh, uh, beginning at 0800 the more members uh, arrive, bringing family and or crew. Um, nine o'clock, there's typically a driver's meeting. Um, we have tow trucks arrive for uh, safety. First aid arrives. And during the driver's meeting, there's always discussion around safety and respect for the neighborhood when coming to and from the property. Uh, cars start running for the test and tune. And I use the parameters on the, uh, on the uh, draft uh, temporary use permit that um, was presented in the staff report, uh, and they're not the hours are not far off what we had done in the past. Um, the cars start running for the test and tune at 10 a.m. and run till noon. We stop for a barbecue fundraiser and 50/50 draws um, for about an hour and a half. We stop at noon, and the proceeds to these go to local charities. At 1:30, the cars start running and go again and go until 4 o'clock. 
Um, the total uh, basic test time for that day is four and a half hours. Once completed for the day, we put things to bed for the night and four, sometimes five campers remain. This is when we can um, have a drink and talk about the day, barbecue dinner, and enjoy the Nymph Falls Park uh, where the kids love to go um, jumping off the rocks and swimming. We're a quiet group of campers and we do not listen to loud music. We do not have campfires um, and our <coughs> age with, our with not including our kids of course is, is in the neighborhood of 50. Um, Sunday morning, members and crew begin arriving around 9, as, does, as do the tow trucks and first aid as the day previous. We ensure that everyone in attendance has wristbands and signed waivers. Um, at 10 o'clock, the driver's meeting uh, begins, and the discussion is similar to the Saturday morning, and if there were any concerns that came up from the day before, they're discussed. Testing begins on Sunday at 10.30 and continues to noon, where we break again for lunch, basically the same as the Saturday, and at 1.30, commence testing again. Uh, 3 o'clock, testing stops and people start departing. Um, we and other volunteers stay and uh, we're the last to leave and leave no trace behind that we were there at all. The total hours testing on Sunday is three. Um, we were not aware previously that the temporary use uh, permit process was in place for us to utilize or we may have started it from the very beginning. Um, and I'll just go back to the expenses because there's been some concern uh, that I'd like to address about, you know, these members pay, where does the money go? Somebody's making money off this. But we do have ex uh, extensive expenses. The timing truck um, <coughs> itself, and it houses the timing system and electronics. The timing system, sensors and lights are uh, an incredibly expensive um, venture and we have those in, as an asset. Traction compound is a regular expense, safety equipment, liability insurances, the tow trucks to attend for the two days, additional water trucks and equipment um, for fire uh, in the event of fire for fire safety, uh, the porta potties and hand washing stations as well as the groceries for the barbecues. Um, Alcohol was also uh, noted in one of the letters. Uh, we just wanted to be super clear that alcohol is not permitted. There's zero tolerance for alcohol consumption uh, before and during the events. Um, uh, I mean, you don't drink and drive, right? It's just common sense. So um, I just felt the need to address that because it was in one of the letters that we received. Um, the other really important um, item that I wanted to address was harassing, bullying and intimidation as has been noted by um, some residents that, um, that that's a problem. Um, previously, uh, last year the Comox Valley Record had uh, posted something on the website and there there were some not very nice comments on there and I'd like to clarify they were not made from our membership. Um, there were also comments on social media that were also not made from our membership. Um, we have zero tolerance for harassment, bullying and intimidation and any member behaving in this way would be removed from the club. Thank you. Did you want to um, talk about any safety? Um, yeah, I can get into the safety of it. Uh, one of the big concerns is fire for us. Um, basically, <coughs> most of our cars, I would say 90% of the vehicles that are running up there are street driven vehicles. Yes, they are high performance vehicles, same as what you could buy back in the day. Um, we've done them up a little bit more, of course, um, other than if it's basically a bone stock brand new street car, you're not going to put a roll cage and stuff in it. I mean, these cars have been, and we have a fair amount of those, right? We have a family that runs bone stock brands bank and new cars. One happens to be a Dodge Challenger, one happens to be a Dodge Charger, and the other one's a Mustang. So they're, and we do have a fair amount of street driven vehicles. Um, our race cars that we do have, that we classify as a race car, they have full safety gear in them. Um, I do 100% safety. We go on NHRA um, safety pr procedures, which is National Hot Rod Association, which is everybody goes by that. It's, it's what everybody adheres to. Um, our vehicles are tested every year. It's they're 100%. Some of our full race cars have full safety fire suppression systems in it. So if there is a fire in those ones, um, we have a shutdown system and they do have fire extinguishers built right into the car. So the fire basically goes out on if there is a fire instantly. 
Um, most fires that are caused are usually going to be on the start line and it's usually from a backfire. Um, so we're right there with our fire extinguishers anyways, we're on the start line. Um, we have fire extinguishers down the whole track. Um, we have quads um, with fire extinguishers on them so we can be there in like seconds. Um, we run a complete uh, system for if there's an oil spill. We have an oil spill kit. Um, and um, the idea of the, all of this is safety. Um, we're behind it 100% of, of for fire, any of that. We pretty much have it covered. We have two fire trucks on site. Um, one that the property owner owns, the other one we bring in from one of the people that happens to be a member of our club. Um, other than that, there's not really anything more other than safety. Um, I did get from when they were trying to put, which they're still trying to work on, is the racetrack in Camel River. Um, I got the decibel meter readings from that test. Um, I circulated it. I give three copies out, so it would be something to look at, at what actually, how loud these cars are. The car that they tested in Campbell River is a high-end race car that does not run on these tracks. Um, <coughs> we don't have a car within the club that's the same car as that, so our cars are actually quieter than what was tested in Campbell River. Was that the reading for that car that you're discussing? Um, yeah, so I, I can give you the, the, the readings from, from, this, from this test. Um, basically where the closest neighbor is, which is Luke, um, the test up there would have been 104.5 decibels. Um, at two and a half kilometers away, that same test was 50.2 decibels. Um, to give you an idea of how loud that would be, a chainsaw is 120 decibels. A jet on takeoff is 130 decibels. A lawnmower is 90 decibels. So it just gives you, show you how loud our vehicles actually are. And we're talking about race cars. I mean, the street cars are basically your normal street car. Very good. Well, thank you for that. And um, at this point, um, I'm going to thank you very much and dismiss you from the table. And we're going to take a vote on receipt. And we're going to receive the correspondence as well. Okay. We'll do it separately, though. We're already on, on receipt here. So um, on receipt of report, all in favor? That carries. Now, um, if we can receive receipt of, of all correspondence. On, on that's actually on item two. We'll do that a second. So first and second on receipt. All in favor. And then also, uh, if we can possibly get a motion to um, to uh, vary the agenda and go down to the addendum. There is some some uh, letters for receipt on the addendum as well. On varying the addendum, second here on that. Uh, do these include the copies we got uh, just now, like the printed copies? Or? That'd be what we receive under the addendum. Yeah, we'd be receiving those under the addendum. Yes, so uh, second. Okay. So uh, well, on varying the, uh, the agenda, all in favor, and then a motion to receive the addendum on, on those letters. So, okay. All in favor? Okay, it brings us back up to item two, and uh, at this point, I'm just wondering if there's anybody in the gallery wishing to speak on this matter. And if so, um, I'll start there. We'll get you to come to the mic here and state uh, your name and where you live, and uh, you'll get three minutes, if that's okay. Thank you. Do I press the button? Do you want me to run it? Okay. You can hear? My name is Jeremy Green. I live at 5001 Forbidden Plateau Road with my partner. We have lived there for 30 years. We have built our home and we love it and cherish it. 
Over these decades, we have also designed, implemented, and planted a two-acre garden on our five-acre property. With this garden, I have over 70 varieties of Acer palmatums, Japanese maples. Most I have grafted by my own hand. I have access to every type of plant available in North America, and my garden reflects it. Which is why I get requests from the, for garden tours from the Horticultural Society of Courtney Comox, the Rhododendron Society of Courtney Comox, and numerous other groups who know about me and have heard me through my work. One of the, app, uh, one of the aspects of our garden was that we designed garden rooms in there. And these are private rooms where you can go in, sit down, and get a different vista of all the different plants. I have 15 of them. And one of the things that we like to do on a summer's day is read the weekend newspaper from front to back in any one of these rooms. Full sun, full shade, dappled light, it is a pleasure. I'm over 60. I have still acute hearing. At five paces, I can hear a wasp chewing on my cedar lattice, making pulp for its nest. It's magical. I hear everything in my garden. I do not want to be forced to go inside, close the doors, shut the windows on a beautiful summer's weekend, and still not get away from the drone of the noise. Thank you very much. Please. Um, we're allowed to do questions. At the committee, at the committee's discretion, <coughs> Director Arbor, are you open to questioning? Okay, and then. Okay. Oh, please. Um, so, how f how far are you from from this site? Uh, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Yeah. We are two kilometers up the windy road from Further the drag strip. Okay. Yes. And the noise funnels up the road okay. by the contours of both sides of the mountains. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. And uh, somebody else willing to speak? Please come up and state your name. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you. My name is Shane Belk. I live at uh, 4890 Forbidden Plateau, so uh, still on the pavement, but about halfway back up to the, uh, the dirt road. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm opposed to the TOP, as many of the other residents are. Um, I have taken time off work to be here today to speak to you, um, as well as many of the other residents have, because we feel that this issue is that important. Um, I know there are other re residents that are opposed to the issue um, who will not come forward um, and or who could not be here today. Um, so I have, uh, I guess, basically four main points. Um, one's got to do with some of the supporting information in the TUP from the RD. Um, two points there, one from the RCMP and the other point from the, uh, the fire department. In terms of the RCMP <coughs> not having an issue or having no concerns, um, I would say that in general the RCP will not attend any issues in our area and that has been generally been the case whether it's uh, public noise, public drinking or dangerous driving, they will not come. We had a meeting here with RD staff about three months ago and when the co topic of bringing up the issue as a, a noise issue and reporting it, they said do not report it to the RCMP, they will not attend. Um, any, so any comments from the RCMP that there are no issues to date? is basically a mischaracterization of reality. Um, they have not heard, we have not heard any issues because residents have been told to not report them, period. In terms of the fire department um, and them not really having concerns, um, I would say again, that's a mischaracterization because the fire department will not attend fires up there for a good half of the um, Forbidden Plateau area. They, they don't cover it. Anyone on the dirt or above basically is outside the fire department's jurisdiction and they will not come. Um, so when there's a fire risk, uh, those residents, so we've all worked hard, uh, and some of the council knows, we've worked hard to expand protection and put plans in place to deal with that, and that's, that's unchanged, it's still a reality. Um, my second point has to do with safety. 
Um, to date, when, uh, when events have been held, they've spilled over into the surrounding area. Uh, it includes reckless driving and harassment. Um, Kate was almost run over by a Jeep at the last Jeep Palooza. And then, you know, for riding your bike on your own road, and then you get verbal harassment after. Get off the road, along with all the rest of the words that came after. Um, the, pro pro the proponents have admitted not having control of the events to date. Uh, and when situations arise on the property, the claims are those that actions not involved with our group, not our problem. We're not responsible. Sorry. Now we're going to scale up the size, duration, and the scope of the events. <clears throat> the RID has uh, required insurance and indemnified themselves. When accidents, injuries, property damage, and fires occur outside the property of the event, who will pay the price? <clears throat> not the property owners, not the RD. It'll be the residents. Um, I'll skip the next point. My last point is I bought my property in 2011 to build a wheelchair accessible home for my daughter. <clears throat> I spent five, five months planning that custom build. My entire home and all of my property are purpose built to be wheelchair accessible. <clears throat> the everyday world uh, that my daughter lives in is difficult enough. Uh, so her home is meant to be a place where life is easier and peaceful. I specifically chose Forbidden Plateau for this purpose. However, these drag rents are so loud that you can't be outside, and you can hear the in noise inside the house to the point where you can't speak when the cars are running. We're at the three-minute point. It has been suggested th to date that <clears throat> those who don't like the noise should leave for the weekend. My daughter can't just go anywhere. She will, why would she have to leave her home and be inconvenient so others from out of town can race their cars? Where will she go? What should I tell her when we leave? Thank you. Thank you. And I remind speakers that you are limited to three minutes, please. Anybody else willing to speak? Please come up. The lady right there. <coughs> I didn't see you. You're, you're hidden by some, there's a head here. Welcome. Thank you. I'm Kate O'Sullivan. Um, I'm a resident of Forbidden Plateau. My husband and I object to the proposed TUP. You have our more detailed letter. We do not agree with the applicant's characterization of drag car events as small, intimate, and uncomplicated, given that the drag strip site is adjacent to a nature park and within a residential area. And an October 20th road association meeting, a Van Isle Airfield Society member explained that most of the cars operate without mufflers or catalytic converters, and that we can't do this on the street because of environmental issues. The CVRD's acceptance of this TUP would be uncomfortably incongruent with their own regional growth strategy, which claims to value ecosystems, natural areas and parks, public health and safety, and also recognizes the worsening climate crisis. None of these impacts are addressed in the TUP. How will the CVRD explain the allowance of drag car events to the nature park visitors and to local youth participants who attended climate strikes here in the valley just a few weeks ago? As other communities object to drag car events, it's difficult to reconcile while the CVRD would be compelled by the singular claim that there is no other location to do what we wish to do. This may not have been everyone else's experience. We are 1.6 kilometers uphill from the strip, and during these events, the noise impact at our home is similar to having a chainsaw on our back deck. Whether or not the racing word is used is immaterial to us, as we've already experienced the noise pollution of test and tune events. If you can picture an amphitheater, our home is located uphill and toward the end. The berm that has been recently invested in does not protect <coughs> the nature park or homes like ours. The consequence will be that it funnels even more noise directly towards us. It will be worse for us. As the CVRD staff has already indicated they favor this T TUP, the only way to indicate they have any respect for those of us who live in the area would be to further limit the numbers of days and hours that is currently proposed. Further, the fire department adds an extremely limited note to this TUP, but of imminent concern is that the CVRD has not addressed in their report risk management when forest fire danger ratings are four or higher. We propose that if this TUP is approved, the drag car events are prohibited when fire danger ratings are four or higher. The event organizers and property owners have demonstrated important limitations in their capacity for managing events safely. Their claim that the events have been none other than perfect contradicts their own recent admission at the Road Association meeting where both the society and property owner acknowledged they lost control of some of the participants. Given this history, will CVRD bylaw officers attend to ensure compliance with any negotiated agreement? 
Several residents of Forbidden Plateau have stated to us they were reluctant to voice their concerns. This concern is reinforced by a Facebook post which shares a letter from a supporter in favor of the airfield as a location for such events. The letter is addressed to a CBRD director and it reads, I think the few complaints you're getting now will be nothing compared to the complaints you might get in the future if the property owners decide to make it miserable for those few people who continue to complain. To be clear, we will contact the RCMP immediately if we experience any harassment as a result of our position against this TUP. We are counting on you, our elected representatives, to upload the, uphold the bylaws that were in place when we invested in Forbidden Plateau as our home in 2013. Thank you. Thank you very much. And fellow here. Hello, uh, my name is Joseph Conley. I've been a resident of Plateau, Forbidden Plateau Road for, since 1983. Um, I moved away, rebought in 2012 and I've been a resident, permanent resident ever since. I'm actually here to speak on behalf of Luke Trigg, that is properties adjacent to the uh, opposed uh, site, sorry. I'm gonna, I got an email copy here so it's going to be hard for me to read. So, hello CVRD board members. I'd like to thank you all and others present for being here and taking the time to listen. My name is Luke Trigg and I've lived at 4705 Forbidden Plateau Road. I have moved to this address in 2001 and have been lucky enough to call the Comox Valley home since 1988. I bought my first home in 2001 and, and have seen many changes in the property which surrounds mine at that time. My neighbor Dan has always been very respectful and courteous in notifying me of any changes or plans to operate machinery such as excavators or dump trucks well in advance, especially, especially work has to be done on weekends. As well, he has always kept the hours of operation within reason starting later than I am sure would like in the mornings and ending in a respectful time in the afternoons with plenty of daylight left. At our most recent Forbidden Plateau Road Residents Association meeting, some concerns was raised by one or two residents about the temporary use permit being applied for the Van Isle Airstrip Society in order to regulate the days and times for them to be able to test and tune their cars prior to traveling to their off-island race events. Nothing that the noise Noting that the noise was so loud that they were unable to speak on the phone or inside their house. The noise that the test and tune event emits is no different than having a large truck or a Harley going by the house and is much more pleasant and exciting than the typical weekend sounds of neighborhood or neighbors on their chainsaws or on a Sunday morning with the sounds of a fully booked dog kennel right across the road, which occurs almost every weekend throughout the year. I live right in the middle of Dan's property, and as you can see on the map provided, I don't have a map provided, so I apologize, um, almost adjacent to the end of the airstrip. When the last test and tune occurred, yes, I could hear it had been previously informed by Dan, so I knew it was going on. The noise, level, the noise level was actually less than I had expected. I can sit outside of my deck and talk on the phone quite easily. In fact, that's exactly what I did. I called some friends and family and said, you have to come over and visit me to check out these cars. They are so cool. However, by the time that they arrived and set up the lawn chairs, the cars were done for the day in the evening around 3 p.m., and that's when the barbecue started. Uh, I moved to Forbidden Plateau area because I love nature and the peace and qu quiet I enjoy 365 days a year. I, view, I feel very blessed and, and to be able to live in this area. Some days I think I'm the luckiest man alive. Dan, both Dan and the Van Isle Airstrip Society have raised tens of thousands of dollars throughout these, that was my three minutes. So I just basically he's, he's, he's for it. He's the, the closest neighbor to it. I live at 4490. I'm with 400, within 400 meters downstream of the exhaust. I, I'm for it. I don't have a problem taking these three days out a year. So Thank you very much. Thank you. Any further speakers? Hello, <clears throat> my name's Alan Sawchuk. I just live upstream of uh, the airstrip there. Um, I moved there about four years ago, built my house, uh, probably the way the crow flies, two and a half kilometers, and uh, I am for a, a TMP, uh, TUP. Um, I believe it's, it's great to get a TUP, being that then there's control on the event, um, and I think it, it can be reviewed, you know, looked upon as, as a good thing. I, do, I don't necessarily agree with a, a zoning change. I don't think for this scenario it would work, but... Uh, <laughs> 
Yeah, so anyways, I moved from uh, Vanny High School area about five years ago where, um, as everybody knows, Music Fest is allowed. And, uh, you know, Friday, Saturday, and even Sunday, they're allowed to make similar noise to one in the morning. So, um, and I realize it's probably city controlled now, but I'm, I'm assuming it was regional back in the day. Uh, so I feel if, if they're allowed to do that, then it'd be kind of hypocritical not to um, at least look at uh, other TUPs elsewhere uh, for noise levels. Um, the climate change has come up. Now, <laughs> I'll be brief on this one. Um, okay, so say you, uh, you view this as a problem for climate change. Well, yes, but if you don't allow it here, all they're going to do is drive elsewhere. They're going to go to Vancouver. They're going to take ferries. They're going to burn more fuel. Um, so for a response to climate change, if anything, you're kind of doing a favor because you're having uh, it local and uh, less, less fuel for people to get here and, and do something that they, they enjoy. Um, Jeep has been has been brought up and um, I feel that's completely separate from this so I, I think any arguments there for safety or whatever has gone on in the past there that's it's a totally different event so you can't really combine the two um, yeah anyhow I uh, don't have much else and there's hang on Alan oh. we got a question for you <coughs> Thanks for your presentation. Um, the comment that you made about um, the zoning change, could you elaborate like why you think a zoning change is not appropriate? Well, the, it's actually news to me that that would even be considered. Um, I thought it was just for the, yeah. um, the use permit there. And uh, since that came up today that, that it can't be done indefinitely, then that is, I guess, the only way out. But uh, I feel that the use permit is great because then you guys have control over it, essentially. You know, you can put on restrictions and, and you know, get community input, and, uh, and I think that's what we need. We, do, we need community input. Okay, thank you. I guess, I guess, yeah, sure, that answers your question. Thank you. Oh, sorry, one last thing. I do have um, a list from the community that I'll give to you, the people that are for it on, there's 91, re 91 residents that, that are for it. Um, who do I hand that to? Thank you. It's in the hands of a planner. <laughs> You're in good hands now. Now I'm encouraging everybody. You're next, and please don't be shy. This, uh, as you can see, is is uh, not confrontational. We're going to stick <coughs> to the issues, not the personalities. And I welcome everybody to speak, if even if you're not comfortable with public speaking. We'll be kind. Thank you. Thank you, Director Grief. Uh, my name is Paul Rebbit. I live at 4767 Forbidden Plateau Road. If you refer to the map on the wall there, my property is directly west of the red line. In fact, you can just see my barn there, I believe. Um, I have uh, submitted a letter, several points. I won't go over all those points, but I think there's a few of them that need to be addressed. Uh, first of all, um, the proponent um, gave a decibel meter at distance for a race car and then compared it to decimal levels at proximity for chain chainsaw. So just please don't be fooled that a race car is quieter than a chain chainsaw. A race car at distance might be quieter than a chain chainsaw, but in proximity, it is much louder. In fact, if it's 10 decibels louder, that means it's 10 times more intense. If it's 20 de decibels louder, that means it's 100 times more intense. So let's not be fooled by that. that. Uh, these cars are loud, and loud noise really depends on whether you like it or not. If you like rap, then loud rap is enjoyable. If you hate rap, then even quiet rap is noise. And so if you enjoy car noise, like some of the neighbors do, then this isn't noise and it's not, not, not disturbing. If you happen to be one of the many neighbors that does not want that type of noise in your neighborhood, then it is really disturbing noise. It not only is loud, um, it ruins our day. Um, it was compared to Music Fest. Music Fest runs for three days a year. The TUP requests nine days a year. This is going to be three times longer per year, benefiting far fewer human beings. Many thousands of people go, go to mu mu Music Fest. We're talking 30 cars at this event way more disruption for way fewer people over a longer period of time with, frankly, louder noise. Um, doo -doo. 
sorry, I'm just trying to pick out which ones are the most important. Um, got one minute left. Thank you. Um, if you look at the map, the campers generally don't camp on the drag strip. They camp to the west of the direct drag strip, which is right below or next to our pro property. Our property is west and above the direct drag strip, so any berms or any sound and deadening that they try actually just travels up to our pro property and it's like you're there. Uh, it is very loud. Um, also notice if you look at the east end of the drag strip, how close is that to the property line of the park and how close is that to the forest? Well, they might be able to restrict people on their property, people traveling from, people at Barber's Hole can walk within, it appears from here, 10 meters of the strip and they're still on public land and not being restricted from that. And of course, there's force there, there's trees. A car that goes out of control or starts fire is really very close to that, that, that park. Any questions? Okay. And, and just as a correction, uh, we are talking six days, possibly three days a year. Okay, so on the TUP, it lists nine days. That was to capture the camping on the Friday night, but the racing would be restricted to Saturday and oh, Sunday, being okay. six so days. Not yeah. the actual yeah. test, test and tune day. Mm -hmm. So, come on up. I don't know if there's any help to you, but there's a C-O-O-K-I-E in the back room. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, thanks everybody for putting up with a little bit of noise. I'm one of the owners of the property and I just wanted to get up quickly and emphasize that uh, we've heard from five households that are clearly against it and we re understand that and recognize it and we're willing to uh, you know try to work towards making it better and easier for them um, but I'd just like to emphasize what Alan said that we do have 90 residents that have already given us consent to be represented here today <coughs> in support so just to weigh that against five households that are obviously against it. And that's basically just what I wanted to emphasize. And do you have anything to say? <laughs> he says he likes cars and he can't wait to start practicing in his go-kart. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anybody questions, sorry? No? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm sorry, did we get your name for the record? Oh, Kevin Greisel. Thanks, Kevin. Okay. Don't make, make me come over there. I just had, may I? Certainly. Oh. Okay. Sir, I just left some stuff up here. I'm going to take that. Okay. Is that all yours? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you again, uh, Tanya Woodbeck. Um, I just, for the record, really um, wanted to ask, I believe it was Kate that mentioned she had a letter from a, a member that was of a harassing nature, and I would love a com no, was I didn't say that. Oh, okay. If there's a comment or if you have something, if anyone has something from one of our members that has been um, intimidating, harassing, um, please bring it forward to myself. Um, or uh, the president or Kevin, and we will address that. I'm very, very serious about the intimidation and harassment type of behavior. Um, so oh, you're referring to the letter that was posted on Facebook in support of the one that will make things miserable for us if we disagree. Is that what you mean? I, I think so. Yeah. I just on if Facebook, I, I can if you could interest. share that with me. It's thank you. Easy to find. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Calling for first time for any further speakers. Calling for a second time. Calling for a third time. Thank you very much. And I would like to sincerely extend our appreciation of all the people coming here and exercising their democracy. And as you see, some of us are wearing a poppy in acknowledgement of our, our grandfathers and uncles, some of which passed away, fighting for freedom of speech, among other things. So this is our cherished right, and I'm glad you guys got, came here and, and exercised that right. So thank you all very much. That brings us to receipt of all the reports, all the verbal reports. And seconded. Okay. All in favor, that carries.
Anybody want to move the recommendation for discussion? Well, we need to put it on the table if we can. We can always because I've got some I've got some comments that I have not made at this point. So, do we want to uh, move the recommendation or move it with uh, with an amendment? Move the recommendation to allow discussion. Thank you. Um, only to allow discussion. That's what we do here. Okay. okay. So, Director Arbor. Or, sorry, Director uh, Amir. Yeah, just to, to clarify, <coughs> because it was brought up um, around Music Fest, um, are staff aware what the zoning for the area around the exhibition grounds is to allow, you know, that type of activity? Uh, through Director Grieve to Director Hamir, um, the, uh, the location of the Music Fest is in the city of Courtney. Right. Um, so it's outside our jurisdiction. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Director Arbor, any comments or more questions, perhaps? Uh, yeah, and I look forward to your comments as well. So I'll keep mine short. But um, I mean, it's it's uh, it's. It, it's a difficult one, obviously, because uh, I think what we're dealing with is something that often happens is there's been, I mean, it was mentioned that there was no awareness of the temporary use permit, but I'm sure every homeowner is, is, is aware of what they are zoned for or not. And so, you know, I think we all know what, what we're doing and what we're trying to get away with stuff or not. Like, I think all of us have, have uh, know the status of our property and what we're allowed and not allowed to do. In this case, it seems like, like many places, there's been a historical non-compliance in regards to use. Um, the CVRD, not just on this topic, but on a number of topics, is is trying to uphold the bylaws and, and the zoning that we have created as a community. Um, and in this case, the, the the temporary use permit is a process that was, you know, in this case, recently considered to try to uh, to bring order to the activity. And that has elicited <laughs> and brought to the front a lot of concerns, I guess, that were lying in the, in the background from neighbors who probably had been accustomed to hearing the noise for years. So it's, um, you know, it's not that atypical. It's just that this one is, is more, I think, gets more to a personal basis. And, and I'm wondering if, um, I think the uh, the proponent did a good presentation in, in describing the culture and, and the people around their activity, and I, and I think the, the comments that we heard from uh, other people that have concerns. Uh, I'm wondering if if you know if we're trying to um, obviously we we're decision makers. We like to decide, but I'm wondering if staff heard new things because there's a few things that the, the people uh, that had concerns about. There's a few suggestions that they were making in regards to if a temporary use permit was considered. So I'm, I'm wondering if, from, from a staff's perspective, you see value in allowing your more time uh, to to consider all the issues that have been brought forward. Some of them very recently, uh, you know, late last week and things like that. Or whether you you uh, you would prefer to uh, to go with the information we have and feel that that is sufficient information. I mean, it's a question I'm asking myself as well, don't worry. You're in the hot seat, John. Sure. Through the chair to Director Arbor, um, what's good about this application right now is we do have time. Um, their uh, TUP, if it gets approved by the board, is, is not triggered to 2020. Um, their first scheduled um, event is, I think it, I believe it's in May. Yeah. In May. So, um, you know, if, if this um, committee wants to defer this to allow staff to meet up with both sides again. Um, so just so you know, um, staff has met up with both sides numerous times, um, just one on one, but we have never put them in the same location at, at the same time. Um, but if, if their um, committee wants staff to meet up with, their, um, with, with both sides and, and have a discussion with them, we can to see if there's any other options or, or how we could move forward. Yeah. Thank you for those comments. And I mean, <clears throat> yeah, I, I just feel it, it's an issue that's been many years in the making. And this TUP process is bringing a lot of stuff forward for both parties. And, and 
and there's still a few questions for me even I mean I, as director Hamir just stated you know there's still a few things that are in the back of my mind when you look at your options and uh, you know like the Saratoga thing was mentioned that uh, the time there's no timers but then I hear there's a portable timers that is being used here so I still have I still feel like I haven't rounded fully around how we're going to arrive at a long-term solutions that 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 satisfies all interests and so I, I i am inclined to to move for deferral but our, it is area c and i would really like to hear the words of wisdom from our chair as well um just w one last comment if that's all right uh, through the chair to director arbor um your, your question in regards to have we heard anything new um this is the first time um we, we staff has heard um from the residents about our staff report and our, our recommendations mm -hmm. Um, um, but in regards to um, the nuisance component and the concerns with noise and 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 how um, you know SAC will control um, if this um, um, proposal will expand, um, that's the stuff that we have heard from from the one side already. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <coughs> actually, uh, I attended the Forbidden Plateau. Um, Road uh, Residents Association meeting, AGM, at the Dove Creek Hall a couple of weekends ago, and uh, Ton True actually slipped in the back door and stood against the back wall. So we, we got a, a pretty good first hand uh, uh, account of uh, some of the people's opinions in the community. And I, I took notes, and uh, out of 16 speakers, um, it was fairly even. You know, there was some ambivalent some for, some, some against. Um, I think what we have to focus on here is what we had previous was not sustainable. We can't have these kind of events going on at length at different times when nobody has any heads up it's going to happen. What we're talking about, I think the original proposal was uh, three weekends out of the year, 365 days, that's 159 days, you're not going to have the problem. Um, you know, sometimes as decision makers, it's not about getting your way, but it's about finding a way. And obviously, when you try to bring people together and come up with a solution, um, it goes back to Bismarck and his, uh, his statement about uh, politics being the art of the compromise. So you're really not making anybody happy. You're not, you, you can't please all the people. Um, I think you know, we, have, we have to live in a world of give and take. We have to have a little tolerance. Um, I think that uh, to accommodate uh, the people that, that do this, we are simply asking for a trial run. So we're doing a test and tune on the test and tune. I would be favorable of going ahead with it. The only difference I would, would make, I think, is because it, it would be very annoying to have to put up with it on Saturday and then it starts up again on the Sunday. So I, I personally do like the concept of it just being the one day. Because then if you, if you lose one day of a weekend every two months for the summer, it's, it's not the whole weekend. You just, you just have a Saturday where, where the issue is going on. And when they talk about DB levels and whatever, I mean, I, I don't know if the regional district uh, bylaw department has the wherewithal to go out there and, and measure the DB levels. But I would challenge any dragster out there to compete with me and my Les Paul and my 100 watt Marshall with my vintage Ibanez tube screamer turned up full volume. I could probably match them pretty good. <laughs> yeah. That's a different language. It's, they can talk different languages too. Everybody has their lingo, right? But um, I, I would propose an amendment that we, we do the, the, the test of the tests and tunes, but we limit it to three Saturdays that's in the staff report. That way is not a huge hardship on the, on the five residents who are in opposition. It's, it's three days out of 365, if I could get a seconder. Okay. Director Arbor. I nearly went for it, but 
what my thinking is is um, you know the staff report came out on Friday and and staff just told us a lot of people that have shown concern is the first time they see the kind of thinking that we have and we also heard concerns about the content of that TUP the value of, of that of having that staff report is now we got something to talk about and I would say so I would go back to the deferral concept with, with sending a signal that if the residents can have a look and provide some feedback on it and we move forward as our chair said with a test and trial there's also a signal that by next year if they come back for a temporary use permit we're going to need to see some happy residents we're going to need to see people who are who are satisfied that the criteria that that has been put forward and i understand the risk of that is that some people will be never ever and and they can come back and we'll have to balance that but I, I think it's it's tough to make a decision when people just receive information around what we propose as a regional district, and and I think it would give both parties a chance to you know you know just have have a good look at it, see see if they're comfortable with it, and and staff has said that they they are not opposed to that uh, that that approach to try to get a little bit more information. So on that basis, I I would move deferral. Referral or deferral. Gr uh, uh, whatever brings it back after people. Deferral. Deferral? Yeah. deferral. You deferral time and place? Time and place, uh, I would ask for staff advice whether, I mean, uh, if it's possible by next month, I don't know what, uh, you know, by the next EAC, I don't know if, if Russell wants to comment. I do think it, it bears to note that people have taken their time off work today. Yes, no, I and. So and, they're just to postpone a decision to get to the same place that we are right now so, so, so I think it should be longer than a month so, so if I may I I don't want to take away the time uh, that we have put in today in consideration of this this matter and and I really respect that and and to be honest if everything goes well I could see nobody showing up next time if everybody's happy with what what we end up with you know if if, if the if we can refine what is being proposed in the top so I'm not trying but uh, we can defeat my, my motion of deferral on that basis. I, I really appreciate what you're saying. I would turn to our CAO if he has any comments. I was just going to forward. confirm that the next meeting is December the 9th, and uh, probably the best is sooner than later while this is fresh. And I uh, look to planning, and I think that they can turn around within a month's time. So. Do we need a seconder on that, on the uh, deferral motion? I could comment to the deferral or um, well you're not really allowed to time and place if we defer it then then I won't be able to comment right like we will be that will be done so I won't move to I'll second it on deferral all in favor defer to December 9th opposed. sorry opposed. opposed December 9th Okay, December 9th. Very good. I'm going to call a quick recess right now and allow the gallery to stretch their legs. And uh, if you want to stick around for the more boring parts of this meeting, please be my guest. <laughs>
Uh, two minutes, we're going to call the meeting back to order. Actually, make that one minute. Calls me back to order. And we're on item number three, Electoral Area B Development Variance Permit 1670, 1673, and 1675. Ryan Road East, Lenco Development Limited, Fernco Development Limited, and Norco Development Limited. Thank you. Over to staff. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And I welcome Brian Chow to the table, who will uh, take you through the next two reports and answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. So thank you to the chair, to the committee members. Uh, for this particular variance, I'd like to first introduce the agent uh, for the project. His name is Jason Hendricks, and he represents uh, Lernco, Fernco, and Norco Development Limited. Thank you. Okay. Welcome to the table. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we have a development variance permit. Uh, in front of you, um, the property is zone industrial light and the size is approximately 3.9 hectares in area. You may know the property uh, as the site of South Asian Army and some of the industrial buildings that fronts on to Ryan Road. Um, for the security and safety of the customers, the applicants would like to install a fence uh, that will ultimately end up uh, as high as 3.1 meters in height. Uh, not all the part of the fence will be like that, but the maximum height will be uh, 3.1 meters in height. And the fence, <coughs> the chain link fence, will be set back from 3 meters from all sides. Because as part of the industrial demand permits they had last year, uh, they agreed to putting a 3 meter vegetation buffer that surrounds all three sides. And so the proposed fence will be three meters back. Uh, the reason why they need uh, extra height for the uh, variance is because due to the grade of the property, it does slope so that uh, on the east and the south side of the property line, uh, they need to put lock blocks on top and to level the site in order to be able to have a, a security chain link fence just surrounding it. Um, just so you know, because with the new zoning bylaw, uh, the maximum height for industrial building, uh, industrial site for the fence is three meters. So they're asking for 3.1 meters, a difference of 0.1 meter. Uh, area B, A, P, C met, and they supported the variance, and there are three reasons why. Uh, one is duty grade, there's no other options available for customer safety and security. Secondly, that this is a reasonable request, and that uh, the proposed request is not much different from the new Sony Barlow limit. Uh, we do receive one support email as of today, and it's coming from 19 Wing supporting the variance. Uh, Mr. Chair. Very good. 
And directors, any questions or comments? Seeing none, I'll thank the applicant and excuse you from the table. Thank you. And uh, we'll vote on receipt. <coughs> All in favor? That carries. I'll move with correspondence. That's a good idea. And uh, is there anybody in the gallery with comments on this matter? Seeing none. A second on that. So on receipt of the correspondence. All in favor? That carries. And who wants to read out the recommendation? Read it out. Um, I'll move that the board approve the development variance permit DVB DV 11B19, Lenco Development Limited, Fernco Development Limited, and Norco Development Limited, to increase the maximum height of a fence to 3.1 meters on the property described as 1671, 1673 and 1675 Ryan Road East, and that the corporate legislative officer be authorized to execute the permit. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion on the recommendation? Seeing none, I'll call the question on that. All in favor? That carries. Thank you very much. <coughs> Um, okay, so to the chair, to committee members, uh, may I move on to the next item? Yes. yes okay, please. moving Aye. forward, uh, development variance permit, uh, 4696 Montrose Sorry. Drive, Adams Well, and Nana Rakar. Move and second, obviously. Okay, so about that, uh, to the chair, to the committee members, uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce one of the owners of the property. Her name is uh, Linda Adams. To the table, please. <coughs> Welcome. Thank you. <coughs> okay, to the chair, to committee members, um, the property is 4696 Montrose Drive and it's approximately 0.23 hectares in area. It's zone country residential one. Uh, the property currently has uh, a single detached dwelling and several accessory buildings. Um, there owner here, uh, they recently purchased the property and they would like to convert their accessory building that's shown as subject building on the screen here from accessory building to a uh, secondary dwelling. Uh, just to let you know, this building received variances uh, back in the day, in 2002, I believe. But because of the change of use from an accessory building to principal dwelling, we have greater setback requirements. Uh, there will be no proposed uh, external changes as part of this proposal. Uh, it's all going to be internal to meet the BC building code. Um, uh, the APC Area A has met to discuss this uh, proposal and they supported this variance because of the following reasons. One, the building's already in place, there's adequate fencing and screening, and that uh, this proposal supports aging in place. Uh, as of today, we have received two support emails, one uh, at 4686 Montrose Drive, which is directly west of the subject property, which is the most um, likely impacted by this variance, and they're supporting it. And uh, one more property over to the west as well, uh, and they were supporting it. So uh, at the end, uh, staff is recommending um, a setback reduction in order to enable this conversion from accessory building to a secondary dwelling. Uh, Mr. Chair. <coughs> And Director Hamir. Great, thank you. Thanks for the report, Brian. Um, just a question to the um, the applicant. Um, I'm in favor. I don't I don't see any problems, but just wondering um, about uh, parking and driveway. Was there actually? I didn't see access all the way to the back. So would you be sharing your parking area at the front of the property with with whoever's in the back? Okay. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, I'll excuse you from the table. I'm going to take a vote on receipt. Thank you very much for your time. Anybody in the gallery wishing to speak on this matter? Seeing none, on receipt. All in favor? <laughs> you oppose that carries. And there's some correspondence for receipt as well. We don't have an addendum. Okay. And there's no addendum. So. On the email correspondence, uh, 
Moved and seconded. All in favor? That carries. And who's going to get the uh, privilege of reading it out? Director Arbor. I'll move that the board approve the development variance permit DV6A19 to reduce the following lot line setbacks in order to permit the conversion of the accessory building to secondary dwelling to reduce the left side yard setback from 3.5 meters to 2.7 meters and to reduce the yard rear yard setback from 7.5 meters to 4.4 meters for the foundation and from 5.5 meters to 4.0 meters for the eaves on property described as 4696 Mount Rose Drive and that the corporate legislative officer be authorized to execute the permit. And seconded. There you go. No further discussion. All in favor? That carries. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Now, number five, electoral area C rezoning of undeveloped property, the Zimmerman. Move and second on receipt. And back over to uh, staff for introductions. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. Jody McLean, Rural Planner, is here to describe the report and answer any of your questions. Hey, hey, Jody. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. We have Nevin Zimmerman here in attendance. I'd like to ask him to come to the table. He's the property owner. And on page six there, there's a zoning map that illustrates this property a little better here. <clears throat> so this is a 0.35 hectare <clears throat> residentially zoned property in amongst several commercial and industrial properties. Historically, it was used to support a gas station that was located to the south on the property that's now zoned light industrial. Uh, that gas station was closed 15 years ago, and this this southern parcel was rezoned to light or re redeveloped last year with a light industrial building. But this property was remained undeveloped and has remained with its original country residential zone ever, uh, s um, since the beginning there of zoning. But now the property owner would like to rezone it to match the light industrial zone to the south, so that he can realign the property lines and develop or sell the lot there remainder lot for uh, light industrial purposes. As the proposal is consistent with the surrounding development of this commercial industrial node, staff's recommending that we proceed with the rezoning uh, application to ref the referral stage. And those agencies to refer to are listed in Appendix A of your package. And staff will report back to this committee with the results at a later meeting, Mr. Chair. Very good, thank you very much for that. Any questions for Jody? Okay, so um, on the receipt of the motion, all in favor? That carries. You're going to take the pleasure there, Director Arbor? To move the recommendation? Yes. I'll move that the Comox Valley Regional District Board endorse the agency referral list as outlined in Appendix A of staff report dated October 24, 2019 and direct staff to commence the external agency referral process for lot A, block 29, Comox District, except parcel A, PID 00543301, as part of a proposed amendment to bylaw number 520, being the rural Comox Valley zoning bylaw number 520, 2019. And finally, that Comox Valley Regional District staff consult with First Nations in accordance with the referrals management program dated September 25th, 2012. Moved and seconded. Well done. Any further discussion? Oh, I should actually excuse the applicant from the <coughs> table, sorry, while we take the vote. No, it's just referring out, yeah, we should be fine. Okay, all in favor? That carries. Now, Gartley Point, Fire Flow Improvement Project Budget Amendment, a report dated October 31st regarding the, a status report on the Gartley Road Fire Flow Improvement Project. And second on receipt. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. Chris LaRose and Zoe Berkey are here to present the report and answer any of your questions. Welcome, folks. 
Thank you, through the chair and to the directors. The Gartley Road Fire Flow Improvement Project was ad identified by Corson Associates as part of a water system study completed in 2013 that identified and prioritized a number of water main upgrades within the system that were need to, needed to resolve fire flow concerns. The 150 millimeter diameter asbestos cement water main along Gartley and Gartley Point Road was replaced in 2019 with a 200 millimeter diameter PVC water main in order to improve available fire flows at one of the furthest reaches of the system. As part of the project, new services for each property were also installed. The project was included within the 2019-2023 financial plan. The total project budget was 450,000, with 424,000 being carried forward from 2018. A number of changes were required after tender close to accommodate Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure changes, and during construction a bypass was necessary to install the new water main on the proposed alignment and avoid impacting the road. To accommodate these changes during construction, a budget amendment of 22000 is ne necessary to reflect the final cost of construction. The project is fully funded from the Royston Capital Works Reserve. We're happy to answer any questions. Happy to answer any questions. Any questions? A joke. <laughs> a joke? I don't know about your jokes. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, thank you. I, I get to see my joke. So yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I'm in support of this, and, and I assume that we will invoice the Ministry of Transportation because that is a requirement from them to have extra cost. That was the joke. <laughs> Not that good. <laughs> Very good. So um, on receipt. All in favor? That carries. And the recommendation. And. The recommendation is that the 2019-2023 financial plan and capital expenditure program for the Royston Water Service Function 312 be amended by increasing water infrastructure expenditures by 22,000 in 2019 for the Gartley Road Fire Flow Improvement Project, project number 1064, to be funded by a further contribution from the Capital Works Reserve, number 839. Second. Moving seconded. Very good. Any further discussion on the recommendation? All those in favor? That carries. Now, Samba conversion project closeout and budget amendment for receipt. Great. This better be good. Thank you <laughs> to the chair. Um, so this report provides a closeout report for the Sandwich conversion process and, and associated works and recommends an amendment to the existing financial plan to cover unanticipated costs in this year arising from the project. So table one in the report summarizes the actual versus estimated costs for the sandwich conversion process, um, which included the system modifications. So this was, these were, this was a, a combined project with the city led by the CDRD. Uh, so that component has come in under significantly, well under budget. Um, the second piece was the installation of meters within uh, the, the water local service area. Um, and this was delivered by the Water Operations Department. Um, and uh, that, that price came in above the final budget estimate, but uh, underneath the maximum communicated to the uh, Electoral Area Services Committee when, uh, when the request for uh, community works funds came, came through this committee. Um, and the third item was uh, was the purchase of or a, a contribution to <coughs> the Veterans Memorial Parkway, uh, which is the water main connecting the that portion of the of the uh, community to the east uh, East Courtney Reservoir. Uh, so that that pipe was built by Courtney um, about ten years ago, um, in anticipation of development in that area, um, which ended up being delayed. The project, that pipe was not commissioned and not used until um, the completion of the works for the Sandwick conversion process. Um, uh, pr prior to, so leading up to this project and as part of the planning, the CDRD did make an assumption that, uh, that, there, um, that the pipe would be acquired by the regional water service at no cost to the Sandwick system, which turned out to be a, um, a, a mistake. Uh, in subsequent negotiations, uh, we did end up, um, Sandwick did end up being on the hook for a portion of that pipe, which um, which, which has turned out to be consistent with um, uh, other precedents within the 
system whereby um, new users contribute proportionally to the share of new infrastructure, which is then handed over to the regional district. So the end result is that the RD now um, owns and operates that VMP line, um, but effectively Sandwick has paid a proportional share of that line, um, and Courtney has absorbed the remainder in a light of the fact that that line now services the two parts of the old Sandwick water district. Um, uh, <coughs> So we, we d were able to negotiate payback of that portion owing by Sandwick over a five-year period to soften the blow to the Sandwick users, but that did end up being an additional cost that wasn't initially foreseen for the users. Um, there, over the project, a total of 627,000 approximately of community works funds has been allocated to the conversion process. Um, you know, that ensured that uh, the meters were installed consistent with our other water local service areas and it also significantly reduced the cost impacts to uh, of the conversion process to the Sandwick users. Um, in terms of total impacts to the residents, um, a total of $3,000 was collected last year from uh, including a $2,000 parcel tax to cover the cost of the physical conversion um, and a $1,000 uh, user rate which was collected for payment of the capital improvement cost charge. And the VMP cost will be recovered um, along with the equalization of reserves amount uh, through a 10-year parcel tax of $257 per property. So the first five years or so of that collection will go towards pay payment of the portion of the VMP and the latter half would, would go towards bringing Sandwick's contribution towards the um, Comox Valley Water Local Service Area Reserve up to the average um, uh, for the other through the aggregation of the uh, of those water service areas. So in summary, the the project uh, came in uh, under budget for the original scope, of, but once the VMP is considered, the total project came in at about one hundred and fifty five thousand over the originally communicated budget, which represents about a twelve percent overrun. Um, and separate from that, the the recommended the recommendation in front of you is that an amendment of 196,500 uh, be approved for the 2019 budget to cover unanticipated expenditures in 2019, which were um, essentially the uh, largely the completion of the meters and the physical conversion process this year. Um, uh, that's it for me. Happy to answer any questions. Here. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Chris, for the report. So that's going to be a very large chunk of tax dollars that it's mm -hmm. going to be very hard for, I think, um, the Sandwick folks to, to swallow. On top of that, um, I'm recalling now some of the cost um, charges that we were thinking of for our asset management in, in the water service. Um, I guess I'm just looking for options of how to soften this tax flow and if there is anything else that we can do to support. I mean, I mean, maybe going back, the, the whole idea of paying for that um, Veterans Memorial Way uh, line is that, you, you stated earlier there, there was precedence around something like that before. Um, and are we aware of any other future like potential costs like this that of us tying into a Courtney line? Uh, you mean for uh, for other systems yeah. or for yes, yeah. yeah, so no no other foreseen um, cost for this particular service area. And I, I just want to highlight, un unless it wasn't clear, that um, that the there's no additional cost impact above what was already been approved through the parcel tax for Sandwick. So what we're calling attention to, I guess, is is a isn't an increase in cost, but um, but the that two hundred fifty seven dollar uh, per year parcel tax has is already in place. Okay. Um, so just just so we're clear, we're not talking about an additional impact that needs to be approved to the to the residents. This this budget amendment of one hundred ninety six thousand five hundred will come out of the reserve, and it it, it was anticipated when crafting the parcel tax okay. that is already in place. Okay. Yeah. Good to hear. Yay. <laughs> um, yeah. But at the same time, like that yeah. whole idea of us paying for a portion of a, a, um, a pipe that the water service, like it was um, meant to be owned by the water service, how, how did that um, 
Yeah, how did that come about? Yeah, so it wasn't it wasn't um, wasn't meant to be owned. I think when it was built, it was it was clearly, it was built by the city. Yeah, and the city built it to to partially in anticipation of having to service their their side of Sandwick, but also to service the Raven development, which is would be would have some type of uh, access off of the Veterans Memorial Parkway. Mm. Um, so that that development has not proceeded. It's it's still in the works in the future. I, I understand. It certainly has been factored into um, calculations for wastewater flows out of out of that se- sector of Courtney. Um, but it was built by Courtney for that. Um, so fast forward ten years, um, we were looking at, at ways to provide the water to that new service area. The conversion is you know, being being now a reality, um, and the decision was that. Um, you know that that should become become a regional line. Yeah. But it was Courtney that footed the bill for the you know, initial the initial to you know combination of of, of, uh, of funding um, means. But it was it was Courtney's project. So so that project is now sort of that infrastructure is now yeah. handed over to the regional district, but paid for by a combination of Courtney and and Sandwich, Sandwich. who are those that be, will be using it. So we're so looking. Sorry. Yeah. Go, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Any future tapping into that line then, how would that cost then be adjusted? Like you now two parties have paid for the entire line. Yeah. Um, who would get reimbursed if another connection was made, for, I guess I'm trying to say? Uh, well, there aren't any foreseen other connections yeah. other than from within Courtney, right. which would, you would, be, would be covered off by the share that they've already effectively paid for that infrastructure. But there aren't any other parties other than Sandwick, Water Local Service Area, and uh, within Courtney okay. that are anticipated to connect to that that line. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, it's a tough one for people in Sandwick. That's <laughs> a real tough one. So uh, my question is, uh, Chris, do you feel comfortable walking the streets of uh, Sandwick without, say, Mike next to you? <laughs> It's been a it, no doubt. It's been a long series of of, uh, of of additional costs for this these service area. Yeah. yeah, but there's a light at the end of the pipe. Okay, so on receipt. All in favor? That carries. Thanks, sir. And the recommendation. Brett Garber. I move the recommendation that the 2019-2023 financial plan and capital expenditure program for the Sandwick Water Local Service Area Function 306 be amended by increasing water infrastructure expenditures by 196,500 for the Sandwick Water System Modifications Project Number 1113 and that the cost to be funded by a further contribution from the Capital Works Reserve Number 842. Perfect. All in favor? That carries. Thank you so much. And Mr. Chair, I'd just like to say that there's more than light at the end of the uh, pipe. Uh, Sandwick has the blessing now with some very qualified staff that are managing the system. It's a metered system. They will be receiving filtered water from the Comox Lake. It was a very rudimentary system with uh, oh, yeah. poor quality water or otherwise. And unfortunately, it was a subject to a lot of politics in terms of uh, being split by Courtney and the regional district that uh, we really had no control over. And, but it is all moving forward. And thank you to Chris and his team. Yeah, my cousin lives up there. I got a full, full ear all the time. <laughs> yeah. And now we are on the Demon Island Bulk Water Service update, a report for receipt. And Mr. Chair and Directors, I'd like to introduce you to Cole Mackinson, who has been hiding out in the solid waste world, but uh, recently made the conversion to our water department, so is here to help present a report on Denman Island and bulk water servicing. Is that a promotion? <laughs> it's cleaner. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, so in 2019, uh, or late 2018, 2019, Glid informed the CVRD that they were no longer providing bulk water service due to liability with their hauler and themselves. Um, CVRD reviewed the analysis and it, um, in June 2019, we went over to have an informational meeting with uh, residents and some haulers to uh, inform them that we wouldn't be providing bulk water after review. Um, just 
due to um, some restrictive si restrictive uh, operational concerns on GLID systems of restrictive filling times, not a being able to meet the full water demand in the summer. Um, at the meeting, there is a strong push from the residents to find a local solution. So we further reviewed that um, and we worked with um, a high level cost analysis. It's just not as simple as putting a standpipe onto their system, just with uh, the batch systems that they work with. Um, we also worked with uh, BC Ferries for um, prioritizing bulk water delivery from the CVRD area with haulers just for an interim solution. Um, but then looking at the cost analysis and with a few items ongoing, we're working on a conversion study with GLID. Um, GLID is also working on surface water treatment pilot project and we're reviewing some grant opportunities. Um, the optimal solution isn't known right now. It's, it, it could be costly and then if the treatment technology changes or grant comes available, it might not be the preferred solution one year down the road. So we're recommending right now just delaying, fin um, finalizing a bulk water system on that site until um, the conversion study discussions are finalized and uh, direction on the treatment technology is completed. Any questions? Questions, Director Mayor. Thank you, and thanks for the report. Um, <clears throat> you have to, I uh, yeah, I do empathize with the community that um, has depended on on bulk water. Do you have an idea of the either the number of customers or the quantity of tanker trucks of water that have been currently being asked of of for bulk water? Yeah, there was. Glid did provide um, the numbers. I don't have them off the top of my head. Um, but is yes. it in the dozens or? In terms of the number of customers, there's there is in the dozens. Okay. Yep. So I, I think we estimated between 50 and 80. Um, and in terms of the volume, we had the peak, peak, um, peak average daily consumption of um, about f over, over five cubic or five five to ten cubic meters. So it was well in ex well in excess of what um, Glid was prepared to provide right. from their current. So, sorry, 50 to 80 households. Yeah. Um, I mean, just judging by what my neighbor does um, with his teenage sons, I mean, that was a tanker of water a week um, through the summer months. So is that times 50 to 80? Is that what we're thinking? <clears throat> uh, that yeah. probably sounds like that's on the higher end of, okay. uh, of consumption. So maybe they're a little bit more conservative on the island so, anyways yeah. because oh. of their water. But so if we're looking at around that okay and um you know i was looking at the pricing costs of private delivery off island um is that what's been used this summer like this past year um i know we had not as hot a season we had more rain but um was water being um tankered off off island i, I believe it was yeah there wasn't a local option so I, we weren't tracking Right. Um, how much was coming off, but the main issue was the trucks are larger there that are coming from uh, the Comox Valley than what was on island, and so you'd end up with a larger load that you'd have to split with a neighbor or yeah. something like that. So logistically, it was a little bit more difficult. Difficult. Yeah. Okay. okay. Director Arbor, I'm interested in what you have to say. Um, so, hmm. so I, I, you know, my, my, my chief concern, I guess, is probably similar to what we have in Union Bay, which is, I don't know which, where we're at in the process of the conversion study. I don't know what will be the outcome of that. And I don't know if, if there's a, I know there's a perception in the community that we might not be able to invest, might be not be wanting to, to invest CVRD dollars because we are trying to get the system. Those perceptions are always out there that we're holding money until we get the system and then we'll invest, otherwise we wouldn't provide a grant or, or consider a grant. Um, 
through our community works funding or anything like that. So, so I'm just I would love the pulse in terms of uh, of um, <clears throat> of where we're at with the conversion study and um, and whether the process is going well, whether there's actual work being done, uh, and when we should expect to see some results. Um, yeah, we just got the conversion study. We had a draft version, and we had some notes from GLID, and we just got it back today. So we're just going to be going through that. And we have a, um, a meeting with uh, GLID next week scheduled. There are some grant opportunities, but um, they have to sign on that if successful, they would um, convert all the infrastructure over into the CBRD ownership. So we're going to be working the next few months on um, on a direction for that, and so, so, so what? So we're putting the grant. So we're going to put in an application with them. We're in discuss. We're in we discussion. But, but I'm just yeah, trying to wrap my head around yeah. where we're at. So that's useful. So yeah. and but then we're saying that if the grant was obtained, then it would convert to that's the part to of the CVRD. Yeah, part of the grant program, um, the ministry <clears throat> makes it a requirement that improvement districts convert over to a regional district. Okay. It, it poses some timing challenges. Yes. If both parties de determine that that was the best option, then there's quite a bit to do. Um, and there's also the matter of how to incorporate some type of assent process into into that commitment rather than, so I, we haven't wrapped our head around that. And that, and that uh, would require electoral assent from the GLID members? Yeah, of, of some sort, yeah. Yeah, so as we've seen in the past, the the bar is maybe a little little lower than than we would typically have for the, the bar is lower, sorry, for conversion of improvement districts in terms of what the inspector of municipalities is looking for in terms of demonstrating electoral assent might be a little lower than you know perhaps in other cases for establishment of regional services. Can you provide more detail on that? So does it mean that for in an AAP process they would need uh, you know twenty percent of people to be against, no, or how does? For it, for I can comment that it's yeah. it's you know, the, the province defines it, and it isn't necessarily a referendum that is required. They just have to demonstrate or prove to the province that their um, residents are in favor. So it's it's up to the province to determine what that process is and weigh the circumstance, but it isn't necessarily a referendum. If I if I have to talk to residents, that that elicits more questions than that <laughs> provides answers. So is there a standard that we can point at in terms of? Um, what we will do is we will seek advice from the province and that they may answer it. I'm sorry for this, that it isn't more definitive, but it is the lack of a role that we have in defining the process. And I also want to say, too, that when it comes to the grant funding, that is the province that is driving the requirement that there be a conversion. It is provincial policy that uh, um, um, improvement districts not receive grant funding, and uh, the province uses, utilizes grant funding as a carrot to encourage improvement districts to go the regional route. Or, or, or incorporation because their policy was to diminish improvement districts and try and have them convert. And then finally, I just want to say that from our staff's perspective, um, this improvement district operates very well and offers a lot of good quality service delivery options that, w that it might be our recommendation to continue with an improvement district rather than convert. But that is, And we've even discussed that with the province at the staff level, that this is an exception. but. They're unwilling to vary or change on, on their policy. Yeah. So once again, the muscle carrot of the from the province is unwelcome, and that's probably why the uh, AVICC resolution from the Naimo Regional District passed that that the province uh, takes a more definite stiff stand, either fold the improvement districts or provide them the same grant opportunities as everybody else, and AVICC voted absolutely in favor of that, and so it makes it really hard to pitch the regional district. To residents, when uh, when you see this kind of strategy employed, that you can only get a grant if if you fold, um, it doesn't help the brand of regional districts. It makes us look like, you know, bullies that take over the world. And so, for me, even on Denman and small conversations, it just makes our pitch harder than just instead of being value proposition based. It feels like it's just forced. So it's just disappointing, but I, I appreciate the work that staff is doing, and, and I mean, Bulkwater is, uh, is um, I think people also appreciate on the other side that we're trying to find a solution to that. Um, <coughs> and if we, that means that next summer there would still, so my messaging will be, and has been, I've already posted on Facebook when the agenda came up, that 
next year it looks like they'll be howling from town as well. And then I guess I'll be at the stable pushing for some kind of resolution by next Christmas or, or next the spring after so that either we're in the game or we're not. Because at the same time, if we're not going to be in the game, it's good to send a signal. And we've already talked uh, at this table around starting a rainwater collection system and, and incentives and things like that, like the Nanaimo Regional District. So um, I know that's a broader conversation than just Denman, but um, yeah, that's my comments. Thank you. Just one more comment regarding timing. I think we can say with confidence that the both the conversion process and selection of the treatment technology will occur um, within 20. Sorry, a, a, a determination on the conversion process and the treatment technology will occur within 2020. Okay. Um, so just to provide a little bit more clarity on timing. Thank you. Yeah. We'll put that in management report. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I, I don't think it's um, in the province's best interest to make regional districts look in, look like they're in a good light anyway. So it is what it is, what it is, what it is. Okay, so that's it for receipt. All in favor? That carries. And there's a couple of recommendations. Uh, that Hamir is kindly offered to put them on the table. I will move the recommendation that a decision on implementation <laughs> of a bulk water station on Denman Island residents for Denman Island residents be delayed until selection of a new treatment technology and a decision on conversion of the Graham Lake Improvement District to a regional service in late 2020. Second. Any other Do discussion? All in favor? That carries and recommendation two. And I'll move that uh, staff be directed to update Comox First Nation regarding water service delivery challenges on Denman Island and the role of the CVRD. Second. And seconded. And speaking to that recommendation, Director yeah, Arbor. So just a question on on the. Um, I mean, I, I'm I'm in favor, but I'm just wondering if is there's a particular trigger or rationale for why this one is here in terms of Comox First Nation. Um, um, Comox First Nation advised me that uh, the, uh, an application for bulk water by an individual more um, um, came forward from Demon Island, and they had real concerns with respect to that, as they have stated their their, their values in water. Yep. So I feel that it is just a good idea that we keep them in, informed as to to what we're doing and and why, and that there may be another solution. I couldn't agree more. Thank you. Okay, then on recommendation two, all in favor? That carries. Number nine, number nine, Community Works Funds Request, Morrison Creek Conservation Area. Moving second on receipt. And uh, Mr. Chair and Directors, Mark Harrison is here to provide an outline of this report and the recommendation and answer any of your questions. Welcome, Mark. Hello uh, to the chair, to through the chair to the directors. Um, I'm just here, staff are here to seek a decommitment of community works funds that is uh, currently allocated to the Saratoga Access um, Parks, Green, Parks and Greenways Capital Project. And um, further than that, we'd like to request that those funds um, be, uh, be set towards capital works plan for the Morrison Creek uh, Conservation Area commencing in uh, 2020. So currently there's a balance of $44,142.98 um, of basically extra community works funds that we'd like to decommit. Um, and then we do have planned capital works in Morrison Creek of uh, 45,000. That's largely to uh, repair an existing bridge, which is uh, made from um, existing metal rail cars. Um, we have, we, it's very, it's actually very sound. Um, and, and very robust for that location. Uh, we have taken all the wood members off that were essentially rotten. So that, um, that section of trail we've closed down. So um, we are planning to um, fix that bridge next year. And that's what that $45,000 um, would be for, which would allow us to uh, have continued use of a historic trail. Um, but also allow us access over Morrison Creek for park monitoring and uh, purposes. 
happy to answer any questions. I think we have one or two. Director Hamir. Great, thanks. Thanks, Mark. Um, just a question around uh, the work at the Saratoga Beach Access. Has that all been completed? <laughs> or was this money set aside for something specific that was supposed to happen there? Um, yeah, that got uh, set aside for the for the actual establishment of the parking lot, and that's all been completed now. So okay. that's extra funds. Okay, great. It's a lovely parking lot. Well, um, this is great, and uh, it's good to, to be acknowledged that we are in Area C territory because when we had the opening of the Linton Conservation Area there, we had the uh, Member of Parliament's representative from Courtney in attendance. A little, I said, shouldn't this be the, uh, the uh, Vancouver Island North MP? Oh, no, it's, it's part of Gord's uh, area. Well, really, it's not. It's Area C. But anyway, it was nice to see somebody pay attention. Okay, well, I don't think there's much to be said on that. Uh, we need to fix the rail cars. And uh, that brings us back to receipt. All in favor? That carries. Do you want me to read it out? I haven't read anything out yet. I guess I'm allowed to, just being chair. Okay. I'd like to remove the recommendation that the board uh, approve a decommitment of the remaining Area C Community Works funds allocated to the Saratoga Beach Access Project in the amount of $44,142.98. And further, that $44,142.98 of Area C Community Work funds instead now be allocated to works planned for the Morrison Creek Conservation Area within the Bain Sound Area B and C Parks and Greenway Services, uh, commencing in 2020. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? That carries. Now, new business. I have some new business. Does everybody have a copy of this? They do. They do. Okay. It has recently come to my attention that the Oyster River Enhancement Society had made a request for a grant and aid from Area C grant and aid uh, for the sum of ten thousand dollars. It doesn't say that there, does it? And it goes on and on. At any rate, uh, I believe it was dated. Uh, this is a different version, but it was dated March seventh. Now, in trying to follow up on it, I think we noted that we hadn't received a grant and aid from the Oyster River Enhancement Society, and uh, their, uh, their dutiful director uh, decided to leave $10,000 in reserve just in case they did make an application. But uh, I think what's happened is uh, something got uh, discombobulated along the way, and um, whether it's through uh, we were remiss, or whether they were remiss, regardless, uh, somehow the grant and aid was not uh, received or acknowledged. So that being said, I would like to uh, put a motion forward that uh, we, uh, we receive this grant and aid application and uh, move it forward ASAP. So a motion to put it on the table? Motion to put it on the table. Okay, there you go. Any discussion? And this would be coming out of your area C? Well, I would, you have enough? I would graciously, uh, no, I, th I think we've got, i got quite a bit of reserve okay. in there for these, these things have happened in the past. Right. You were thinking. Yeah, yeah. I just figured it might happen. But. And also, there's also emerging issues that come up that we never expect, so. Okay, so this is just receiving the, so, any other discussion on receipt of the application? All in favor, receipt. That carries. And a motion to what would we do? It, move it forward to the board. Correct. Yes. Do you have something? Yep. Oh, what a what a bright young man. <clears throat> okay, I'll actually read it. Um, that the correspondence that, that's already been received is that the ten thousand dollar grant and aid payable from electoral area C. Uh, grant and aid uh, funds be applied for the Oyster River Enhancement Society for 2019 to assist with salmon enhancement activities and projects. And we're all on the same page. This page right here. 
All in favor? And I guess this goes forward to the board, right? Correct. So we'll, we'll see it at the end of the month. Very good. Thank you so much. Uh, the addendum, we've already dealt with the addendum. And so, a motion to adjourn to in camera. Mm -hmm. And all in favor? Okay. <clears throat>